I'd like to welcome everybody to a, a live event organized as part of the McGill World Restart a Heart 2021 campaign, which is a global initiative aimed to empower individuals to respond to a cardiac arrest. The goal of today's event is to speak about cardiac arrest and help the general population understand how they can help in a health crisis. My name is Bram Friedman, and I have uh, the great privilege of serving as President and CEO of the Jewish General Hospital Foundation here in Montreal. And I'm joined today by uh, an incredible panel of experts, and I will let them uh, introduce themselves one by one to get us started. Thank you, Bram. Um, my name is uh, Robert Thirsk. I am actually a McGill University graduate. I have a medical degree from uh, McGill Faculty of Medicine and Health Sciences. I graduated in 1982. Uh, I went on to begin a family medicine residency program at the former Queen Elizabeth Hospital in, in Montreal before I was being called to the uh, Canadian astronaut program. I've had the honor and privilege to fly twice in space, once aboard a 17-day flight aboard the Space Shuttle Columbia, and then more recently a six-month expedition aboard the International Space Station. Hi, I'm uh, Michael, Gold Michael Goldfarb. I'm a cardiologist at the Jewish General Hospital in uh, Montreal. Um, I'm originally from Toronto and I moved to Montreal and I've been spending my, I did my training at McGill. I'm a clinician investigator as well. So I'm interested in improving outcomes of people with heart disease, particularly older patients. And um, I'm privileged to be on the panel today. Thank you. Hi, my name is uh, Francois de Champlain. I'm an emergency physician and a trauma team leader at the McGill University Health Center. Uh, and I'm also the president of a nonprofit organization called the Jacques de Champlain Foundation, uh, whose aim is really to try to increase or improve the survival of cardiac arrest, especially towards uh, the action that a bystander can do, which is uh, a focus of our talk today. Hello everyone, my name is Caroline and I'm a fourth year medical student at McGill. I'm the education lead for World Restart a Heart. So as part of our campaign, we created a really impactful educational video about responding to cardiac arrest. And I'd like to share it with you all right now. So it's only 60 seconds and it can teach you how to save a life. So let me just share my screen and play it for you. In Canada alone, every 12 minutes, someone suffers from a cardiac arrest. If you don't do anything, they are going to die. In the next 60 seconds, we're going to teach you how to save a life. If you see someone lying unconscious, the first thing you want to do is check if they're responsive. If they are not responsive and not breathing or breathing abnormally, they are likely suffering from a cardiac arrest. Call 911. Let them know that someone suffered from a cardiac arrest. Send someone to find an AD if there's one nearby, and then start chest compressions. For chest compressions, find the center of the chest, put your dominant hand down, interlock your fingers, and push hard and push fast. Using an AD is really easy. You just apply the pads, turn on the machine, and follow the voice instruction. The machine will analyze the rhythm and tell you if a shock is recommended. Great, thank you very much. I, I think I recognized one of the stars in that uh, video actually. Um, let's open our, uh, our discussion uh, by speaking about the signs of cardiac arrest. So uh, Dr. de Champlain, um, can you tell us how to recognize a cardiac arrest and how that may differ from the presentation of a heart attack? Yes, thank you for the question. Um, it's a very important and very frequent question. I can tell you, people get confused all the time between the two. Very, very simply put, a heart attack is a plumbing problem and a cardiac arrest is an electrical problem. So it, it is completely uh, two different things that sometimes are linked, but not always. Um, a heart attack is a plumbing problem really because there's a blockage of the circulation blood flow to part of the heart. Um, and therefore it deprives part of the heart from blood and oxygen. 
uh, and that blockage is due to either a plaque or a blood clot. And what this causes is really a person to experience almost like, you know, the classic symptoms that we always hear, which are chest pain, shortness of breath, feeling of losing consciousness, nausea, palpitations, uh, really an unwell feeling can be sometimes only shoulder pain or arm pain. But sometimes if the uh, part of the heart is really affected, is really small, it can cause no symptoms and go completely unnoticed. Really a cardiac arrest or a sudden cardiac arrest is a electrical problem because there is you know, a, a, a shutdown of the electrical circuit of the heart, which cause almost immediate um, stoppage of the heart, which will result in immediate lose of losing consciousness uh, for that person. And uh, therefore that person will go on the floor very quickly if they're uh, standing up they will either not breathe or breathe abnormally, sometimes referred as gasping or agonal breathing. This is important because this sometimes is tricky in the recognition and may be misleading. People may think that that person still has some circulation when it's not the case. So it's very frequent actually to have a, a couple of gasping of air. And then really that's a immediate uh, life-threatening condition and if no actions are done very, very quickly, uh, it's almost irreversible uh, death for, for that person that suffered that uh, cardiac arrest. Thank you. And after recognizing that, that somebody is in cardiac arrest, what should a bystander do? And, and maybe you could speak to us a little bit about the, the chain of survival. Yeah, so the chain of survival is, uh, is, is called a chain because it has actually now six links and each link is really, really important, crucial to obtain a survivor in the end. So everyone has to do their part and arguably, um, you know, the first three steps of the chain of survival done by bystander are by far the most important in order to get a survival, regardless of all the advanced treatment that we can do in the hospital. So the first step is really, as I mentioned, early recognition. So someone's on the ground, someone is breathing abnormally, seems unconscious, uh, not responding. That is someone in cardiac arrest until proven otherwise. And the first action should always be to call 911. Um, and right after we notify 911, uh, that person on the phone, the emergency call taker, will guide you through the steps, actually. So this is very reassuring. Uh, they can even give you instruction on how to perform the second link, which is early CPR. So this is hands-only CPR. Now we know from science that hands-only CPR is as effective as the older CPR that involved rescue breathing that people still think of. Uh, so hands-only CPR compressions in the center of the chest push hard and fast. Sometimes we refer the beat of staying alive, a, a, a no song from the Bee Gees to get us the rhythm. But the person will actually teach you to do that over the phone and will even count with you. The third step, which is very important, is to quickly localize a NAD or automatic uh, external defibrillator. And those are you know, very common public places nowadays. And the, uh, again, the emergency caller on the phone may direct you to uh, the nearest uh, AED. In Quebec here, we have a, an app, a free smartphone app that is called like AD Quebec uh, that you can download on your phone that will direct you to more than 4,000 AEDs across the province. In other jurisdictions, there are similar apps. So just find out and this also, can, you can use your phone essentially to locate or to send someone uh, to retrieve the AED. And then it's really the job of the paramedics or the first responders that are arriving that will take over the resuscitation uh, bringing you know, the patient eventually to the hospital, which they will provide care and post-cardiac care. And finally, the sixth link is really the recovery of that patient, both physically and mentally as well. So really with your hand and your phone, two things that we have all the time with us, uh, you can save someone's life by doing something. Great, thank you very much. Um, turning to Dr. Goldfarb, um, Maybe you could give us some insight as to what happens at the hospital uh, when a patient is brought in for cardiac arrest and, and a sense of maybe what are the initial measures 
uh, undertaken by the healthcare team to ensure that the patient has the highest chance of survival? Sure. So the, the patient comes in, and as, as you mentioned, Dr. Deschapin mentioned, we're really, we're really seeing the tip of the iceberg. About you know, 10% of patients who survive that initial um, event get to us. And based on how they were resuscitated at first by the, para, by, by the bystander or the paramedics, um, we often have to continue that resuscitation effort. So the first thing is really finding out, making sure that the person is, is stable. So the, the ABCs, we call them, and making sure their airway, their neurological status, their breathing, and their circulation is, is controlled before we even start thinking about why, why this happened to them or what happened to them. So the first step is really getting them what we call stable medically. Then once we're, we're happy that they're stable medically, we start thinking about what is the cause and the diagnosis. And the diagnosis really, um, we kind of differentiate and categorize it into, is it the heart? or is it something else? There are some things that give us a clue to the heart. For example, if the person has a history of heart disease, um, if the person had a abnormal heart rhythm um, that required a shock from the defibrillator, um, or if we have evidence that it was a very fast heart rhythm, these are things that suggest that it was the heart involved. When it is the heart involved, we also have to differentiate. Is it the artery blocked or is it an electrical problem? And and if it's the artery blocked, we also have to decide, does the person benefit from doing an immediate procedure to unblock it or not? And these are all decisions that have to be made based on the initial assessment in the emergency room. If we do suspect that there is an artery that was blocked that caused this and is causing ongoing problems to the person, we may decide to do an angiogram, which is a procedure where we take pictures of the arteries of the heart and open a blocked artery. Um, if the artery, if we don't think that the person's having any ongoing problems from blocked arteries, we may elect not to do that procedure at first and wait to see how the person does in the future. Then once that initial stabilization has been done and the assessment of what the, we think the cause is, we may send the patient for certain scans, for example, of the head to make sure there's no bleed or maybe blood clots in the lungs. There's various uh, based on what we think is the most likely cause of it. And ultimately the patient will, will most likely end up in an intensive care unit um, for further care. One of the other things that we do is often we prevent fever. So we, we cool them down. And these days we don't cool people down too cold based on the latest scientific evidence, but we make sure that their temperature doesn't spike. Um, and we make sure that, they're, uh, that we prevent fever and we make sure prevent infections and we provide general critical care to give the person as much support as possible uh, during that time. Great, thank you. Um, now, turning, I guess, to the uh, to the bystander um, part of this equation, you know, I think many people might feel uh, intimidated or overwhelmed uh, in high pressure situations, such as witnessing uh, a cardiac arrest. So, I'm going to ask Dr. Thirsk, um, as an astronaut, as as someone who's been in high pressure situations, um, whether you have any advice. Um, to people for how to keep calm and, and focused, um, you know, if you happen to be witnessing a, a, a cardiac um, a arrest as a, as a bystander. Oh, you're going to have to unmute yourself, Dr. Thirsk. Uh, thanks. It's a fair question, Bram, because um, responding to a cardiac arrest is a high pressure situation, uh, undoubtedly. It's a life and death uh, situation. Well, what is important is that we act. Um, as an astronaut, um, I've been in many high pressure situations and I guess my words of wisdom are number one, get all the training that you can get uh, from the 60 second uh, video that we saw a little while ago, you saw that the training is excellent. Uh, we make use of uh, simulators, do that over and over again. I have had um, the opportunity in my career, in my life to perform CPR in real life situations on several occasions. And once I was into it, uh, it really felt like another training session. The training is actually excellent. Um, I guess I'd also say trust your, your training that you, um, you receive. On, on the day when you need to perform it, it will all uh, come, come true. And maybe the last thing I will say is, you know, outside of CPR, even in your personal life, in your professional life, um, look for opportunities to stay out of your comfort zone. That uh, those kinds of actions help to build up that mindset that um, 
equanimity to that internal fiber that helps you to, to respond well and take leadership uh, in the high pressure situations. It'll all work out. And, and I think at most the, 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 the thing that resonated with me was the first thing you said about the most important thing is to act, right? Yes. Is to, I guess, not be sort of frozen, but to do something. Yes. Uh, there's, you know, um, CPR is not a black and white science. Space flight is not black and white. Sometimes we have to make decisions um, uh, that are a little bit fuzzy. What's important is to act, do something. Don't just sit there and, and, and wonder and ponder, act. Perfect. Thank you. Uh, Caroline, maybe you can tell us a little bit about the World Restart a Heart campaign and, and, and what the goals of the campaign are. Yes, for sure. So our goal at RAW is really to increase public awareness and rates of bystander CPR. So we're actually a student-led initiative and we bring together students and faculty members, healthcare professionals and administration at the JGH and the MUHC. And um, mainly what we do is we use social media as a platform to educate the general public about cardiac arrest. So for example, how to recognize it, what the difference is between a heart attack, um, as well as how to perform CPR. Uh, with COVID, it's been a bit more challenging because we've been trying to uh, do more in-person events, um, but we've been able to keep up all our virtual events. So uh, we have uh, social media accounts on Instagram and Facebook where we uh, regularly post about educational content. Um, we also have partnered with uh, special RAW ambassadors such as astronauts like Dr. Thirst, who is here with us today, um, and some Olympic athletes who have shared uh, their personal experiences with cardiac arrest. So our goal really is to educate the communities uh, across Canada and hopefully across the world about the importance of bystander resuscitation and to enhance their knowledge and skills so that ultimately we could reduce the number of cardiac arrest deaths. I think one of the most important things is that people can understand that they can really make a difference and it doesn't have to be a healthcare professional um, that can perform CPR. It can really be anybody who's in uh, that situation. And are there any particular um, initiatives that, that you want to mention? I mean, you sort of alluded to a couple, but... Yes, for sure. So uh, as I said, uh, we do have a large social media campaign. Uh, we have a website, uh, Facebook and Instagram and Twitter accounts where we promote our educational content. Um, we also have promotional videos, one of which uh, I played for you at the beginning of the event, um, which covered how to perform CPR. We also have other videos that share the stories of cardiac arrest survivors. Um, throughout the week, we've had other online events, um, such as this one, to speak about the different aspects of cardiovascular disease. Um, we've had an event about uh, cardiac health in athletes, um, another one about technical technological advances in resuscitation. Um, and we also have in-person events. So um, before COVID, we had a lot more. Um, last year was a bit harder, but this year we've been able to integrate some more in-person events. So we had a booth actually at uh, the JGH uh, on Wednesday where um, we had uh, some of our volunteers who were there to talk about CPR. Uh, we had mannequins there also, so it gave a chance for people to actually practice uh, and get feedback on CPR. Um, and we also have a booth today at the McGill campus at the Roderick Gates. So if anyone who's listening now has time to pass by, uh, please feel free to do so today. They'll be there until 5 p.m. So you can come and, and talk a bit about CPR and uh, try for yourself on our mannequin. Great, thank you, thank you. I, ju I just wanna add, if you allow me just to sure. say uh, that the McGill students are doing just an amazing, amazing job on the McGill Raw campaign for now three years. And take a few minutes, go and say hi, thank them uh, at the McGill campus today. Uh, they're they're great and you'll learn a lot in just a few minutes of your time. Beautiful, thank you. Um, maybe, so we've heard of a couple of initiatives of this campaign and maybe I'll ask uh, Dr. Goldfarb um, sort of, I guess, more generally, um, what, what are some initiatives that you think might be helpful 
to promote general awareness, arrest, and, and bystander resuscitation? Well, I, I think on a population basis, where the money is, is educating every young person in it. And I know there have been some health systems, I think in, the, in Sweden or Norway, I can't remember, where they educated everyone. And that showed in, in high school, you know, in elementary school and high school, and uh, they found uh, associations with tremendous decreases in um, um, uh, it, it, tremendous increase in survival from uh, an out of hospital cardiac arrest. Those first kind of three links of the chain. Um, so I think you know I think it's wonderful what Ra is doing, and I think we need to have a stronger commitment for the government and from educational bodies to really make this a core curriculum for everyone. Because you start with the young people, and they often witness. Uh, older people who are more commonly have a cardiac arrest and they're maybe the ones on the scene. Um, on, the, on the other end of the spectrum, so that's kind of on a population basis, on the other end of the spectrum, um, in the hospital, we have a tremendous population because we have the patients and the families who've experienced this and they've lived experience. And I think they make the uh, tremendous ambassadors as well. Um, they can share their stories and make it much more real when people hear, you know, that this is not some theoretical thing that with tremendously impressive statistics, but these are real people who have real experiences. And I mean, I have personal friends that have gone through it and uh, I have lots of patients that have gone through it and just listening to their stories, each one is, is, um, is different, but they're all similar in the sense that, you know, it's a quite, it's a traumatic event in many ways, not just for the patient, but also for the family, for their circle of friends and for their community. And I think they're, they're a great um, epicenter of, of uh, experience that they can start talking about that they can then influence their immediate family, their, as I said, their, their circle of friends and their communities to all kind of learn these, te these techniques, which as we all mentioned are, are simple and easy to do. So I, I think um, we need we need to approach these on, on uh, you know as on a population scale and as well as from a, a personal experience uh, d direction. Great, great. Um, so Dr. Thirsk, you've been a, a previous uh, raw ambassador, and you've obviously helped to promote the importance of uh, bystander CPR to to a wider audience. And I'm wondering whether you've uh, you have any. Uh, real life stories to share about people who may have benefited from the uh, education uh, provided by RAW and, and they had to perform CPR. Uh, any, any real life stories you can share? Yeah, so I'm very appreciative uh, to the McGill uh, nurses and um, medical students who've invited me to participate. This is my second year as, a, as an ambassador. Uh, so my involvement is, you know, with panels such as this uh, and uh, participating in social media as well. My vision, like their vision, is that um, you know CPR skills are going to be as common in everyday uh, in Canadian society as skills learning to do first aid or doing home maintenance or even driving a car. It needs to be that embedded. So I like to to walk forward with the students on, on that uh, objective. Um, I think what was most heartwarming for me last year was the social media. Um, I got involved in social media and and got some word out about the importance of learning CPR. And some of my friends and people that I didn't know came back with uh, retweets or responses that told me about some incidents on the street or in a train station or at an airport where they were able to step in and, and save a person's life. Uh, the most heartwarming, uplifting story came from actually a, a friend uh, of mine. She is the, the spouse of a Canadian astronaut. And she retweeted that uh, 20 years ago, in September of 2000, her father had a cardiac arrest. And her brother, who is a police officer and a bystander, performed a two-person uh, CPR uh, until the ambulance uh, arrived. And um, uh, her father did well. He survived. He had a triple bypass. He had repair of the, the arteries in, in his heart. He did rehab. And um, she sent a photo of, of him. I don't know if you can see this, but this yep, is uh, I can see it. this is him uh, today enjoying enjoying life. Just think, it's um, you know if CPR wasn't performed 20 years ago, we would have lost 20 years with this gentleman, 20 years of joy, 20 years of of love. And I, I agree with what Dr. Goldfarb said a minute ago. It's uh, it's the personal stories, you know, uh, about. Um, you know, restarting a, a heart that's important. The data is, is important. You know, we, we need to tell politicians about that, but we need to communicate the, the stories. So 
being an ambassador has brought me very close with a lot of these personal stories and these people who have done well uh, performing and um, surviving uh, cardiac arrest. Wonderful. Um, yeah, I think people can always identify with, with real life stories. And I think that's a, also an excellent way to, to pass along the message. Um, I just want to invite um, uh, those uh, people who are watching the webinar uh, that if they have any questions, uh, the easiest way to, uh, to communicate the questions is to click on the Q&A uh, box at the bottom uh, or icon at the bottom of the screen and type in your question and we'll be glad to uh, ask, ask them of our panelists. Uh, so please, uh, please don't be shy. Uh, a couple more questions um, that we have. Um, and, and this is, um, you know, I think this is one that people off, I, that I've thought about, uh, to be, uh, to be, uh, to be honest, uh, that people may have, um, and maybe I'll address it again, uh, to, to Dr. Thirsk, um, you know, people and people sometimes fear that they could do more, uh, harm than good that they're when they try and do CPR, maybe they're going to break some ribs, uh, maybe they'll cause, uh, some damage. Um, and or even if they're using a, a defibrillator, maybe that they won't do it right and that will cause some electrical damage. So I guess, how, how would you respond to those to those concerns? That's a great question. Actually, I'm going to ask if Dr. Deschamplain will also respond uh, sure. to that question. It's a great question. But for my uh, knot hole, um, I would say, like we talked a minute ago, it's, it's important to, to act. Again, medicine is not an exact science. I can remember uh, working in the hospitals and a patient would, a diabetic patient would come in and, and they're in a coma and is it blood sugar too high, blood sugar too low? Don't really know, but you got to act, you got to do something. Um, be reassured that the training for CPR is excellent. And I've been taking CPR classes for 40 years now and I can see how with time the, the, the procedure has been fine tuned. So the, the training, the procedure will, will help you make the correct decisions. In the video, for example, you notice that the first step is that uh, the responders come up and, and ask if uh, you know, the, the victim is, uh, is conscious or and determine whether they're conscious or not. So those kinds of things will help you. The iPhone app will help you. The AED has some intelligence embedded in it. It will help you as well. But again, make sure that you, you act. I would rather, if I'm having a cardiac arrest, I would rather someone act on, uh, on me than worry about a few uh, broken ribs. Please, please act and, and do the right thing. But, uh, I think Dr. Deschamplain probably has a perspective as well. Great. Great. Dr. Deschamplain, and maybe you could talk a little bit about um, the ADs, the defibrillators. Sure. Just to go on on what Dr. Terska just said, I, I, I think that person that wakes up in the hospital on day two with broken rib will want to meet you and will want to thank you for each broken ribs that they have because they're alive to tell the story about it and to even complain about the pain. So never, ever, ever um, hesitate to, uh, to act. And um, you know, going back to what I heard from my colleagues here on the panel, I mean, we had uh, on Wednesday, we had a, a, a McGill grad from engineering that suffered cardiac arrest, Samuel, at age 24 while running. And, um, and even after all this medical workup afterwards, no cause were found. So it's just to say again that um, you know, uh, he now lives uh, with an implantable uh, defibrillator, and that happens. We saw that with Christian Erickson at one of the biggest stage uh, in June, last June, Euro 2020, uh, an athlete, professional athlete that went through all the screening, age 29, collapsed on the, on, on the ground, uh, on the field, uh, gets uh, brought back by a defibrillator. Uh, one shock saved him. Um, and again, they didn't find the cause as well. So again, uh, this is, uh, I like those web webinars because we can bust myths. And, uh, and one of the myth is that this happens more as an end of life, which is not true. It concerns everyone. Uh, now to talk a bit about the, uh, the defibrillators, um, you know, in the first time a defibrillator was used outside of the hospital, it was reported in 1967 in Ireland. And, uh, and at that time, the, uh, the machine was being moved with a vehicle and it, it, it weighed 70 kilograms. Nowadays, with the advancement of technologies, defibrillators, some models are weighing less than 500 grams. 
okay? And essentially, they can do everything on their own. They analyze the rhythm. Once you put the pad, which is the only really action you need to do, then the voice prompt will actually tell you what to do, will walk you through the step. And in some models, you won't even have to press on a shock button. So there's either one button on off or two buttons on off and shock uh, on those models nowadays. So really it's actually, there is a study, a very neat small study done with six graders, not previously trained using an AED that perform 40 seconds slower than trained paramedics using an AED. Um, so it tells you how easy it is to use. So even though I agree with all my colleagues on this panels um, that training is important, we need to change the culture. We need to bring this uh, in schools. And I think Quebec has a vision of doing that fairly soon, I believe. Um, but regardless, this is a change of culture that needs to happen. But meanwhile, if you see an AED, never, never hesitate to open it, even if it's the first time you see it, because it's that easy to use. That's great. And we actually have our first uh, question from, from one of our uh, attendees, which I, I think you, 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 begun, you began to address. And the question is, what are your thoughts about having provincial laws governing AAD accessibility in our communities? Mm -hmm. And why hasn't the province of Quebec stepped in uh, and helped protect our communities? So I, I love this question. I don't know who asked it, but uh, but I it's an anonymous answer. attendee. That's what it says. <laughs> but uh, we've, uh, as a nonprofit, we've been uh, lobbying uh, for the past several years to have such a legislation in in Quebec. Um, you know, Manitoba, since uh, in Canada alone, there's two other provinces already with a legislation. Manitoba since uh, 2011, and Ontario since 2020. Uh, mandates a list of designated premises to have AEDs, but not only that, to mandate the owner to register the AED in a provincial database so that everyone knows where to find this AED, including the 911 emergency call taker, which is currently not the case in Quebec in many, uh, many places and in many other provinces. British Columbia is in the process of passing such a bill. I think this is very important. Um, ADs uh, need to be in more places, they need to be visible, they need to be registered, and then they need to be used. And so those are all different logistic issues that we need to target with different solutions. Uh, so there's not a one solution that fits all, but it's a series of action that we need to target. But definitely a legislation is something we've uh, put a, a petition on change.org, uh, Loi DA Québec, we have uh, we had over 26,000 signatures in a matter of a few weeks. So people are into this. They want this uh, to happen in this province, and I'm sure in many others in Canada, and it's the case in other countries as well. So I couldn't agree more with uh, with that uh, comment. Great. And just remind us, you said there's an app that uh, that lists uh, where the AEDs is that a Quebec or a Canadian? Yeah. Tell us a little so bit about that. There's many apps out there, and uh, okay. honestly, we're a nonprofit, so any apps uh, will do. In Quebec right now, uh, the app that we put in place is called AD Quebec, uh, and, uh, and it has uh, over 4,200 uh, registered AEDs that some volunteers call AEDs owner, explain the project, and uh, register uh, the AD in a database, and we're linking those databases uh, with the 911 call centers. In other provinces, there's other apps. Um, I think it's best to you know, inquire depending if the jurisdictions, but, uh, but there's many out there. The important uh, idea is uh, to use something and the technology is there to rapidly locate uh, an AD. And I think that the technology will continue to, uh, to involve and make it even more easy to locate the ADs in the future. Tracking device in ADs, uh, really, really portable uh, ADs, I believe, they will become private. They will become as, as much as people have a fire extinguisher in their home, they'll have a disposable tiny AEDs uh, that will cost a fraction of the price today. I think that uh, this is a, a stage in evolution. Excellent, thank you. Um, maybe switching uh, gears a little bit uh, for, for Dr. Goldfarb, um, is there any way to prevent cardiac arrest and, and are certain people more at risk? 
A great question. So the, the, the way we look at it, there's really essentially two groups. The first group is called secondary prevention and also primary prevention. So secondary prevention means people that have already had a cardiovascular event, cardiac arrest. Um, and these are people who may be at uh, much higher risk for a second cardiac arrest. Um, these people require specialized medical therapy that's targeted at the cause of their initial cardiac arrest to prevent them from having it subsequently. And that's our goal of the initial hospitalization after cardiac arrest, as well as the follow-up after when they, when they leave the hospital. Um, and they may require devices, strong medications or, or devices called defibrillators, which we discussed. Um, but the, the, the broader question is really in the primary prevention group. So primary prevention. Um, presume of cardiac, uh, presumed cardiac arrest, or they had um, some, you know, they had someone in their family who was swimming at a young age, and they were doing fine in the lake, and they drowned. These are these are things that are, that are razor light bulbs uh, um, for risks of them having cardiac arrest, um, and uh, or a sudden cardiac death. And that's what we really need to focus. So th this population, they really need an assessment to make sure that they don't have the same predispositions, whether it's the structure of their heart or the electrical system of the heart. So, or people that have heart disease, for example, they just need to make sure that you have very good medical therapy and, and adherent, adherent to the best therapies we have. That's the best way to pre prevent it. And then the other half of this primary prevention group, those who've never had cardiac arrest, are those with no risk factors. They, everyone in their family has, you know, they have certain medical issues, but nothing concerning, and they may not have any risk factors for heart disease themselves. Um, and th this group, there's, there's not really much you can do to prevent, you know, you go on with your life, um, but um, let's make sure that you're trained in, C in CPR, make sure those around you are trained in CPR, you can help your community. Um, and every once in a while, someone in this group, although they're at the lowest risk, will have a cardiac, uh, cardiac arrest. There may be better ways in the future of identifying this high risk group with genetic testing and things like that, more advanced genetic testing that we have. Um, now we look for specific, for example, genetic abnormalities or other things that may indicate someone's a high risk person, but usually only when there's a family history or there's a reason to suspect it. But the, the vast majority of the population likely fits in this, um, this category where they've never had an event before and they have no particular risk factors for having an event. Right. And, and maybe um, a question um, in terms of uh, uh, timing, right? So if somebody's uh, suffered a cardiac arrest, sort of what's, what's the timeline that we're talking about uh, in terms of um, performing CPR or uh, shocking them? How, how, what, what does the timeline look like for that? I'll, 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 your, your mic is on. So Dr. Goldfarb, do you have a, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah I, I mean, the, the sooner, the sooner, the better Ta time, it, time is brain. Um, right. the, the, long, the longer you wait, the worse, we know that the worst people do, um, the people that do the best generally are those who have witnessed events. Um, but it's not just enough to witness it. It has to be a witnessed event and then urgent, uh, implementation of, of chest compressions, um, and good chest compressions. And you, you can, if you have urgent implementation of good chest compressions, you can have a very good outcome despite the person taking, you know, sometimes 20, 30 minutes even to bring, to get a pulse back. Um, so you really can make a tremendous difference. So it's really how fast you have to act. And we know that the longer you wait, if, you know, if the person's gone more than five or 10 minutes or it's an unwitnessed event, we know it's much, much less likely to have a good outcome, both in terms of the heart surviving and in terms of the brain surviving. So, so time, time is of the essence. Perfect. And just Dr. one, one, yeah, just go, one go. more quick, just one more quick note. The, the reason the AED and the defibrillator and the shock work so well is because this is the, the, the electrical abnormality that happens is something that, that can be reversed very easily and almost certainly with a shock. Um, and, and the shock is much more effective the faster you give it. If you wait longer, the shock is much less likely to be effective. But when you shock the person and you, re and you reset the heart to the normal rhythm, 
even though the underlying cause of what caused that electrical abnormality in the first place may be still present, the, you, you've just bought yourself tremendous amount of time to stabilize the person and get medical attention and things like that. So the, the, the shock, the time of the onset of chest compressions and the time of the shock are of, of essence. Every, every second, every minute that goes by, the likelihood of success goes down tremendously. Perfect. Dr. Deschaplin? Yeah, maybe just to uh, pursue on, on Dr. Goldfarb, um, Todd, uh, I mean, simply put, sometimes we say that every minute after a cardiac arrest, you lose about 10% chance of survival for that uh, person. So even in a, in, a, in a city like Montreal or any big city, the arrival of, of the first responder or an ambulance is usually around eight minutes. So do the maths. Uh, if you wait until actually the ambulance shows up to actually do something, the chance of survival is this small. Um, it's, it's unfortunate, but the system has to rely in a way on, on the goodwill of someone to act. And we can't stress that enough. Um, you know, doing the, the compression actually restore part of the circulation. When it's well done, we say in best cases, it's 25 to 30% of the blood flow that is actually generated by those uh, compression. But really the life-saving gesture will be like to try to retrieve an AED and as Dr. Goldfarb said, restore that electrical rhythm and cardiac rhythm will, will give like blood flow and will restore all the vital organs because the brain is the most sensitive to a lack of blood supply. And within four to six minutes, uh, the brain cells starts to die slowly. So you want to really start compression and shock that person. That's what you need to do. Thank you. Um, since we are still uh, in, in, in the COVID era, are there any special uh, precautions or implications for, for performing CPR uh, in the strange times that we're still living in? Yeah, that's a question that uh, was on the mind of uh, everyone. And unfortunately, today we, we have data that has been published that has shown that during the COVID pandemic, the rates of bystander CPR really? has mm -hmm. come down. Um, and it was expected, but we just documented that there, there was actually less uh, CPR being given. And, and, I, and I think it's a very valuable fear that bystanders uh, may have. I, I was fortunate to work with a, a group of scientists uh, in a, a society called like Ines in Quebec to put in a, a, a position statement on this specific subject. We reviewed all the literature and, and the two component of CPR that seems to be associated with transmission are the ventilation or the breathing, two advanced techniques that we're not asking by a standard to do. So really the chest compression component is probably, you can't say zero, but probably very, very, very low uh, risk of any transmission. And nowadays here we're vaccinated, so trans is less just by that fact. Um, even though I said that and it's reassuring, um, the recommendation is still, you know, you, you can't go very far from your house today without right. a mask, a face mask in your pocket. So we still recommend the rescuer, the bystander to wear the mask before uh, starting the chest compression. And it's also recommend to try to put a mask or any cloths or a shirt over the mouth of the person you're trying to rescue. Um, what you're doing with CPR is provide circulation. That circulation already has oxygen. Right. So you're not going to obstruct by putting a simple clot. There's still some sort of a passive oxygenation that are, is being done simply because of the compressions that you're doing. Um, so don't be afraid of that. But that probably would be the two simple measure to act uh, you know, on the street. And with what I know on the subject, and I read most of it, on, on this particular subject, I would not hesitate a second in front of me. Perfect. Thank you. Um, as we master can resist in asking the question about, um, you know, what do you do about uh, medical emergencies or acute care? And when you were, when you were in space, were there provisions for 
Part of the um, qualification to become an astronaut is a very extensive medical exam, which uh, should rule out most uh, cardiac causes of, um, um, of cardiac arrest, cardiorespiratory disease. Um, but as uh, Drs. Goldfarb and de Champlain said, you know, we, there can still be incidents, uh, cases of uh, seemingly healthy people, athletes who uh, suffer a cardiac arrest. So we are all trained prior to flight on how to perform uh, CPR uh, very efficiently. And we make use of an onboard uh, AED uh, as well. Uh, not all flights benefit from the presence of a physician astronaut. So that means that uh, a jet pilot <laughs> astronaut is going to be leading uh, CPR as, uh, as well. Uh, it's probably also true to say that everything that we do aboard the station, the daily routines, brushing teeth, combing hair, showering, things like that, that changes. And uh, CPR is no different as, as well. So we make a few um, changes as, as well. One of the, the most amusing ones is uh, the position of the, uh, of the rescuer, the bystander. Um, typically uh, on, on the ground, the, the rescuer is kneeling on the victim's side and then leaning over with chest compressions, but that's not how we do it in space. I don't know if you can see this, if I can get this in focus. Mm, that's not trouble. No, oh, 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 wait, there, a little bit back, <laughs> a little back. We'll try one, stop. Right there. Got it. Okay. So. Um, what uh, we do in space, because of Newton's third law, for every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction, uh, chest compressions from the side don't work. So what I do is I flip up, I put my feet on the ceiling, and then I use my, my legs to, to provide the, um, the compressions. Uh, everyone is trained to uh, you know, start a, a catheter or start an IV, but in a, in a rush, uh, sometimes we'll uh, give the cardiotropic drugs through the endotracheal um, tube. And then the other thing maybe that's kind of interesting is that the entire structure of the space station is, is metal, it's, it's aluminum. So we have to be very careful when we use the AED to make sure that the, the victim is isolated from the, the structure. So we have a, a composite material or, or a non-metal um, stretcher that we place the, uh, the victim on just to make sure that um, no one gets uh, electrocuted. So there's an, a number of nuances. There's a number of uh, emergency situations Contingency situations that can occur aboard a spacecraft, fire, depressurization, but also cardiac arrest is one that we train for extensively uh, prior to flight. And we actually uh, retrain, refresh our skills every month and a half on orbit as well. Great. Thank you so much. Um, we have a couple of uh, questions um, and maybe I'll address them to, to Caroline. So one is, uh, how can a regular person uh, get involved and raise awareness about AEDs and, and CPR? So that's the first question. Uh, and then the second question for you, specifically for your campaign, um, what are your, the future goals of the RAW campaign and any special plans for the year ahead? Yeah, for sure. So uh, I think it's important for everyone just to, to have a discussion about cardiac arrest and CPR. It's, it's something that um, people who aren't in the healthcare field um, are kind of hesitant to talk about, or um, they may just have questions, but it's never really addressed. So what I've done personally is just, I, I brought up the subject with my family, with my friends who aren't in medical school, um, and we just talk about it. So um, a really useful uh, resource to use would be, of course, just going on our campaign, going through our social media um, and sharing it with other people. Um, because really what we're trying to do is, is grow and, and reach more and more people um, so that they've heard about this. They know that um, this is something that everybody can do. Um, and we're really trying to destigmatize it so that um, it, it's something that people can, can regularly talk about and uh, hopefully practice more of. So that's something that we would like to do is to offer more opportunities for students to actually practice hands-on CPR um, so that that way they can feel more comfortable and less hesitant if uh, the need were to arise. Um, and something else that we're uh, hoping to do in our campaign um, is to add a fundraising aspect. So um, we focus mostly, mostly on uh, the educational part so far, which is great, and we have to continue to promote that. But um, I think the next steps for us that we were thinking of doing was looking at fundraising events. 
um, we were thinking of doing like a five kilometer run so that we can both promote uh, good cardiovascular health, um, but also raise money for some organizations like Heart and Stroke. Excellent. That's great. Um, maybe I'll just open up any closing as we as the an hour nears its end. Any closing comments from any of our panelists? Something that we didn't cover that you want to mention before we uh, before we wrap up? Well, I'll just say to Carolyn and uh, the other uh, nursing and medical students that the 60 second video was excellent. And I hope that you have opportunities to show that um, uh, on many, many other occasions. I think it'll go a, a long way to communicate uh, the message. Perhaps a, a public service announcement on, on a TV network would be very helpful. Keep up the good work. Thank you so much. Yeah, we've had the opportunity to present it at a lot of the McGill classrooms. Um, and uh, it's available on YouTube. So if anybody uh, wants to go on our website, McGill Raw, or um, on our Instagram or Facebook pages, you can easily access the link and uh, you'll see there's that video and there's a few other ones that are really interesting to, to see as well. And we thank you so much for, for your support, Dr. Thursk, and to everyone else um, for, for really uh, promoting this really important message for us. Great. So just, um, sorry, Dr. Deschamplain. I, I was just going to close by saying that, uh, you know, I've been, uh, it's my second year on the steering committee of the McGill Rock campaign. And again, um, you know, I'm privileged to be working with such a group and, uh, and the students that are engaged in this uh, campaign are awesome. And it's growing. Uh, last year, uh, I think the reach through social media was over 500,000 people. Think of that. How many classes would you need uh, to fill? Um, and today, the, 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 uh, the hybrid or this week, the hybrid um, format is, is very impressive. Uh, really, it's a privilege. But again, if there is one thing to take out of all those webinars or campaign, it, for me, if there's one message that should resonate in everyone's mind is do something. <laughs> do something regardless that you right. feel prepared. You'll never feel prepared. Even if you took a course six weeks afterwards, you, you already stop like, you know, thinking of this and, and whatever. So you know, just do something. When you go in a public place, notice where the AED is, uh, simple to use, never hesitate to act. Uh, you will never get a second chance. You'll live with the fact, could I have done something? Should I have done something? I didn't feel ready or whatever. Just do something. And the only thing that can comes out is you save a life and you're a hero that day. Great, great. So I just want to thank on behalf of the Jewish General Hospital Foundation, I'd like to thank um, all of our uh, participants um, and uh, all of our panelists uh, for, for the last hour. Very, um, very illuminating, very educational and uh, greatly appreciated. So good luck to everyone and good luck to the RAW program uh, to continue its very, very important mission and have a great day, everyone. Thank, Thank you, you, everyone. Thank you so Thanks. much. Thank Thanks, you. Bye-bye.